Good evening and welcome to a continued study of the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. We're very happy to welcome each of you. Those of you that are joining us by television, we welcome you. If you're listening by radio, we welcome you. And those that are tuning in or, how should I say, patching in on the Internet, we welcome you also, and we appreciate you being here. Well, we have come down to the last chapter of the book of Revelation, and the closing chapter. And I hope that our journey through the book of Revelation has been helpful to you and maybe given you some insights into the book of Revelation. And I hope above anything else, it has created in you a desire to be in God's kingdom because he's done everything that's necessary for you to be there. Doesn't, not anything that uh, is required that Christ hadn't done for you so that you can be in his kingdom. And we're very glad that uh, you've been here and been able to go through this time with us. Uh, tonight, our subject is the victories won. Uh, we've come to the end. And uh, the beast, the false prophet, the dragon, all Babylon has been done away with. She is no more, and God has come and set up his kingdom. And so that's what we're looking at. The victory is won. Christ is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, and he is ruling over and above it all. And so we are thankful for the hope, assurance, the great assurance that we have in Jesus Christ, that soon, real soon, he's going to be coming back, and that you and I can have the privilege of being in his kingdom. We've been blessed having the His Voice Quartet with us, and uh, I've enjoyed them being here very much. Uh, one of the quartet members, Todd Spainauer, was able to bring his wife, Tracy, along, and uh, Tracy, stand up so the folks know who you are. And we're just very happy that she's here. Thank you for coming, Tracy. Appreciate that. And they're going to sing for you tonight. And I'm sure you'll be blessed as they uh, sing a song called The Great Getting Up Morning. And so I'm sure that you'll uh, enjoy that very much. Chuck Algar, who has read the scripture for us night after night, it's going to come and read uh, Revelation 22, verses 6 through 24. And so we hope that it'll help you take the admonition that God has. God bless you. Good evening. Again tonight, if you have your Bibles last time, please take them and turn them to the book of Revelation, chapter 22. And we want to read that together tonight. So if you have your Bibles with you, Turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 22, and let's read together. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw... I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do it not, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who keep the word of this book, worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of this prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every one according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexual immoral and murderers and idolaters 
and whosoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears come. And let him who thirsts come. Whosoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book. And if anyone adds to these if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this prophecy of this book, God shall take away his part from this book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Well, the last chapter of the book of Revelation has a lot of admonition about the book of Revelation. And that's, you'll find much in this chapter, is admonition that God has given to you and me concerning how we are to relate to the book of Revelation. That's really what's in this chapter, and we're going to take a look at what the Lord has to say about how we are to relate to it. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. What words? Well, the words of Revelation, all that he's written here. These words are faithful and true. These are things that you can build your faith on, that it won't fail, that it's there, it's solid, it's true, so we can believe it we can follow it. They're faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels to show his servant things which must shortly take place. Now he's reaching back clear to the first part of the book of Revelation where he talked about that and said that what he was showing were things that were going to take place shortly. Now he's ending the book and says, I've shown you these things that are to take place shortly. So those who are seen, follow me, those that are seen, these prophecies that he gave in the book of Revelation, those that are seeing those prophecies fulfilled know that the Lord is coming shortly. Okay? The thing about it, folks, is you're the ones that are seeing it. Therefore, the promise that the Lord will come applies to you and to me in a very, very strong and definite way. Okay? Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Started out the book of Revelation, and it started out by saying, Blessed is he that reads, and he that hears, and he that keeps the words of this prophecy. He now ends the book by saying, Blessed is the person that reads these prophecies. So, dear friend, if you want to receive a blessing, study the book of Revelation. Because there's a blessing that God pronounces upon it to that person who reads and understands the book of Revelation. And you and I need to make it very, very clear in our lives what is happening, what's taking place, and what's going to happen. Unfortunately, this is not the case. Unfortunately, very, very few people know anything about the book of Revelation. If you were to go out here and stop the first ten people on the street and ask them about Revelation, they can tell you nothing about it. There is almost nothing said about it. To most people, the book of Revelation is a closed book. They, I've talked to lots and lots of people. They say, well, I just don't understand it. I just don't know what it's talking about. Well, I can understand that, but I will say this. There is no reason for that because God promises that he'll bless you if you read it that he will help you understand it. But you find that there are many, 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 if 
folks, false beliefs about the book of Revelation. There's lots of things that are taught that are absolutely false concerning the book of Revelation. And you and I cannot afford to not read it and understand what it's saying for our own sake, to know what is truth so that we can follow it. Other people are told it's simply not important. Not important whether you understand it or whether you don't. Yes, it is. It's vital that you understand it in this day and this age. Where are we? Where are we in the book of Revelation? Those of us that have come this far in time, where are we in the book of Revelation? Well, to begin with, we can see, folks, we can see clearly the image to the beast is being formed. All you got to do is read the newspaper, watch the television, read magazines, and you can see that the image of the beast is in the process of being set up being formed. So we know what that is, and we know what is going on there. We don't have to be in darkness. We don't have to be in doubt. We know exactly what's happening there. Secondly, we can see paganism, apostate Protestantism, Catholicism. We can see that all coming closer and closer together. Pick up the newspaper and read it, and we see where they're opening up and accepting beliefs that are absolutely contrary to Scripture. And so paganism and Protestantism and Catholicism are coming together, joining hands. We see that happening today. So where are we? Well, we are living. We are living in the time of the 17th and 18th chapters of Revelation. If you want to know where we are, that's where we are. The time of the scarlet beast, we're living at the time in which this is all being set up, where the ten kings are being formed. That's where we're living, folks. That's the time that we're in. So what I'm trying to tell you is we're not in the first part of the book of Revelation. We're in the latter part of the book of Revelation. Very last part, it's running out. In fact, after the 17th and 18th chapters, when you go to 19 and 20, you have the marriage supper of the Lamb and the Millennium. That's what's next. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb and the Millennium. So we're, we're right there. And then after, of course, that, you come to what we're talking about tonight, Revelation 21 and 22, which talks about the new heaven and the new earth. So I don't know. If you sense or if you understand where you are and where at the time in which you're living. But I would say to you that over and above anything else, you need to prepare, prepare to be in God's kingdom. You need to get ready because I believe the time is short. You don't have a lot of time left. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book. Don't close it up. Well, let me tell you. Through the preaching of such men as Luther, Knox, Zwingli, Calvin, and all these reformers, if you go back and read them, you'll find that they were perfectly clear on the prophecies as best they could understand it in those days. But they understood what was happening. They understood much of what was being said for their day and their age. And they pointed their finger clearly at Catholicism and said that it was not doing what God wanted them to do and they needed to change their ways. Let me tell you something. Luther, Knox, Zwingli, Calvin, 
all those men, they were trying to get Catholicism, Catholicism to change the way it was. They were trying to get them to come back to the Word of God and to build their faith on the Word of God. This was what they were endeavoring to do. They were not trying, folks, to move away from the church. They were trying to bring about a revival within the church. They were trying to bring them back to God's Word, but they rejected it. They would not have anything to do with it. They would not take their advice. They would not look at what those men had to say. And so a schism or a breakaway took place. And we find that Luther and Knox and Zwingli and those men began to preach the Word of God. They preached the prophecies in the book of Revelation. And they pointed clearly and said, that's the beast. And out of their preaching, thousands, thousands upon thousands left Catholicism and came into that of the Reformation. In fact, under Calvin alone, 500,000 Frenchmen accepted the Reformation by the preaching of God's Word and preaching the prophecies in the book of Revelation. It shook. It shook the Catholic Church to the very foundation. So much so that they called. They called what was known as the Council of Trent. And in the Council of Trent, that council basically trying to establish two things. Whether they should build their belief on the Word of God or whether they should build their belief on the Word of God and tradition. The Pope called in two men, one by the name of Ribera, one by the name of Alcazar, two priests, and told them, Whatever you have to do, do to get the finger off of us. Those two priests developed two different concepts of prophecy. One developed a, pro a concept of prophecy called the Predestor view, which takes all the prophecies in the book of Revelation and puts them in the past and says they've all been fulfilled and they have no reference to you and I at all. That never did catch on very much. But another one developed a concept called futurism in which it took all the prophecies from the fourth chapter of Revelation on and said those are all in the future. And so you have the concept of futurism coming in and follow me carefully now. Everything from the first chapter through the third chapter had to do with the seven churches, the seven churches of Asia. And so they apply that as it is. But when they get to the fourth chapter, they say all that has to do with the future and takes place after the coming of Jesus Christ. Therefore, as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, we don't have to be concerned with it because it doesn't take place while we're here. This only takes place after the rapture, and I don't know if you're understanding what I'm trying to tell you tonight. I'm trying to tell you they close the book. There's no interest in it. Why should I read it if it has nothing to do with me? And so you find today that churches all across this country and around the world don't know anything about the book of Revelation. And they don't know anything about it because they have been taught the futurist concept. They've been told that all that takes place after the rapture, that you're not here during that time, therefore it doesn't have anything to do with you. And they have taken that very verse where Christ said, be careful, 
don't seal the words of the prophets of this book, and they have sealed it so that people do not understand it. And that's what they're faced with today. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Here the angels appeared to him. He showed him all these things. Listen, there's something that takes place here that's very vital because it says, Then he said to me, See that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Now, folks, if you take the book of Revelation and you start through it, the central theme all the way through the book of Revelation is worship. That's the central theme all the way through is that of worship. And when it comes down to the very end in which the time you're living and I, it's a matter of worship. And it will be that all the way through to the end. The dragon, the false prophet, the beast, you know what they want? They want worship. That's what they want. That's what the Scripture says. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? That is what they want, is worship. And worship belongs only to God, only to Jesus Christ. Therefore, I must give to him my allegiance. I must give to him my adoration. I must give to him my praise. I must give to him my worship because it belongs to him, no one else. But they're saying, no, worship the dragon, worship the beast. Do what he says, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall what? Serve. I shall worship only Jesus Christ. I hope, I hope that you take time each day to worship the Lord. Just take time to offer to Him your praise, your thanksgiving, your adoration. Up to this point in the book of Revelation, John has been talking. All of a sudden, something at this point happens. John has been writing different things, but now, all of a sudden, Jesus steps to the front, and the rest of the 22nd chapter of Revelation are Christ's words. All before, the, John wrote them down, recorded them, put it there, but now, as we're down to the end, Christ steps up, and these are his words to you and to me. He who is unjust, let him be what? Unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. In other words, it's simply saying that it's over. It's all come down. Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to give everyone according to his works. Down to the end. No change, as I said to you earlier. You're not going to develop character after Christ comes. Your character will have been set and settled. It's going to be taken care of before Christ comes. So when he says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. Every case 
is settled and decided. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Christ is trying to assure you and me that he is the beginning, and he was the beginning of the book of Revelation, and he is the end of the book of Revelation. He is the beginning and the end of the book of Revelation, the Alpha and the Omega. Get unto the end of the very last. In other words, the curtain on human probation has closed. No more. There is not any more, folks, the door of mercy. How thankful I am the door of mercy tonight is open. But it's not going to continue to be open. It's going to close. And when it closes, it's going to close for all mankind. Salvation is totally and completely free. You cannot, you cannot add anything to it. You can't put something there when it comes to salvation. Salvation is something that Jesus Christ has done for you and me, and he gives it to us totally free. All we can do is accept it. Clear? Okay. But man will be judged by his works. Salvation is a free gift. I simply accept it. But when it comes to the judgment, you and I will be judged by our works. And our works should simply be the results of a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what our work should be. But we will be judged by them because that is an indication of where we are and what we believe. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and they may enter in through the gates into the city. Let me tell you something. The commandments are the dividing line. Follow me. The commandments are the dividing line. When it says, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, there's a reason for that. Because it says outside the city, okay, are dogs and sorcerers and sexual immoral, murderers and idolaters, whoever loves and practices a lie. All that is outside there. So we find that this is the situation. There are two camps. You clear? Two camps. One, those that keep God's commandments, those that don't. It's that simple, folks. Those that keep his commandments, those that do not keep his commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. You can cut it, you can slice it any way you want to, but it, when it comes down to it, it's those that keep God's commandments because worship is shown by obedience. I cannot say, well, I love you, Lord, but I'm not going to do what you tell me. See, uh, worship is shown by obedience. If I love the Lord, then I'm going to obey him. And so when it comes to it, God says, here are my people. These are the people that have served the Lord, walked with him, and followed him. These are his people. All right. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you the things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. This, when he says he is the root and the offspring of David, that's rather strange, isn't it? Huh? 
How can he be the root and the offspring? Two different things. Huh? He, by the way, he asked the Pharisees that, and that messed them up. Terrible. They didn't know what to say or what concerning that. But he is the root. He's the root before, because before David was, he was. That's right. He existed before David. He's also the offspring because of the genealogy in which he came through. So he's the root and the offspring. And contained in this with David is the very covenant that he made and he promised and he said, I'm carrying out that covenant that I have made with you. Therefore, to you and to me, he must be the bright and the morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. There's the invitation. Whoever desires, do you desire tonight? Let him come and let him take of the water of life freely. Oh, dear friends, please drink. Drink of the water of life. Drink it and drink it abundantly. Don't be stingy with it. Drink it. Until your cup runs over and overflows, drink in the water of life. That's what God wants you to do. It's given freely to anybody who wants it. So there's no question. You don't have to miss life. It's free to anyone who drinks of it. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in the book. You see, he's protecting what he's given. He's saying, here, don't be adding anything to what he has given. That you and I need to read and study the Word of God to find out what God has given and if anyone takes away the words of the prophecy of this book, God shall take away his part from the book of life and from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. I don't want to add to it. I don't want to take away from it. I want it to follow exactly what the Lord says. That's the promise to you and to me. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God shall be, and a God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. Now this evening I want to share something with you, and I hope by the grace of God I can help you see this, that you will see how marvelous God is and how wonderfully is and I'm going to go back and pick up a little bit of what I talked about in the last presentation because I want you to see it and understand it Revelation 1 verse 5 it says to him who loved us washed us from our sins in his own blood washed us from our sins in his own blood how thankful I am that it reads that way. He washed us from our sins in his own blood. And it says to him who loved us, I'm glad that God loves us just exactly like we are. See, he, it doesn't say he washes us and then loves us. It says he loves us and then washes us. I mentioned this before. I'm glad that God does not love us like we love babies. You know, if the baby has been bathed and powdered and smells good, anybody will pick it up and love it. 
that you let it have a snotty nose and a dirty diaper and see how many people go the other way. See? Well, that, that God loves us just exactly like we are. That's the way he cares for us. And then he washes us and cleanses us from our sins in his own blood. How marvelous that is. But now watch, because he does something for you. The next verse says, And has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. It says, and he has made us priests, or kings, and priests to his God. That does not say, if you do this, this, and this, you might become a king. It doesn't say that. That right there, dear friends, is the very heart of Christianity. It's the very, very heart of it. God says, he has made us kings and priests. Therefore, because you have accepted Christ, you have become a king and a priest. Therefore, because you are one, you ought to act like you're one. That should motivate me. That should move me. That should be why I'm there. He doesn't say, well, if you qualify, I'll make you that. No, he says, I'll make you that. And then he will in turn do those things within you that are necessary for you to be what he wants you to be. But what I want you to notice tonight is it says that he'll make you a king or a priest. Now you need to follow. Revelation 5 verse 10. And hath made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. So he said he's going to make us kings and priests to his God, and we will reign on the earth over and over and over in the Scripture. He continually talks about making you a priest. Did you know that? Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be, what? Priest of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So here again, he says all those that have accepted him and followed him, that they become priest of God and will live and reign with him for a thousand years. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with, where? With men, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Now here it says that God is going to come and he's going to live here on this earth with us. That this earth will become his home, his headquarters, that he will live here with us. And that each one of you will be a priest. That's what it says. That he's going to live here and that he will be our God we shall be his people, and that each one of us will be a priest. For you are a, what? Chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are a royal priesthood. Oh, not after the Aaronic priesthood, but after that of Melchizedek. You are a priest. Now, you have a very definite reason for being a priest. Because a priest does what? Well, a priest ministers 
That's what the priest does. He, he ministers to the needs of people, cares for them. And it says that all of you will be priests. His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So here it says that you are going to be God's own special people. For what purpose? Hmm? Yeah, to proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay, that's what you're going to do. You're a priest, and you are going to share with others how he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I'm coming quickly. Now, You see, when Christ told the parable of the one lost sheep, he was talking about this earth. Out of all the universe, God's vast universe, this is the only one that has ever sinned. This is the only place there is sin. And Christ came and redeemed us, died for us. And so the vast universe is full of unfallen worlds, beings that have never fallen. But God makes his home here. This earth will become the center of the universe. And unfallen beings will come from everywhere in the universe. And they'll come to this earth. And you know what? You are going to be a priest because you are going to tell them the marvelous story of how God or how Christ called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, because you know something that none of them know, none of them have ever experienced None of them have ever known the marvelous grace of God. They haven't known the work that he did in your heart to change you and make you different that pulled you out of darkness and brought you into his marvelous light. They don't know any of that. You're the only ones that do. And so you will be a priest of God and you will serve him because you will be there to tell others the marvelous story of redemption, what God has done for you and for me. Marvelous privilege to be a priest or a king unto God. That's what he did, that we might be saved. And so he says to you and to me, Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Oh, that'll be a marvelous day when Jesus Christ comes back. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. John ended up the book saying the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be to all of you. Dear friend tonight, if you don't know the grace of God, I hope that you'll accept him. I hope that you'll open up your heart and give him your life because he loves you and cares for you in a very special way. 
Ranko Stevanovich, in his book called The Revelation of Jesus Christ, he tells the story of a couple who went to Africa as missionaries. They went there. They spent their life in Africa, working with the people there, bringing them the good news of salvation, ministering to them, and caring for them all their life they worked there. Now they have grown old. Time has come back for them to come back home. Their health is broken. They don't have any money. And they've come to catch the ship. This is years ago. Catch the ship back to America. And they get there, and they find that there's a lot of noise and a lot of things going on at the ship, and they find out that the ship they're taking back to America, that Teddy Roosevelt is on that ship, that he's just coming back from a hunting trip in Africa, and the people are all crowded around to see Teddy Roosevelt and to praise him for everything, and they get on the ship, and they start across the ocean, and all the hubbub and all the thing that's going on about Teddy Roosevelt and how all the people are so anxious to see Teddy Roosevelt and so anxious for what's going on there. And this bothers the missionary. And he says to his wife, it's not fair. He said, we have spent our life working in Africa. We don't have anything. There was nobody to see us off. There's nobody expecting us when the ship docks. It's not fair. And they got across and arrived at the port. And sure enough, here the band is playing, and all the people are shouting, and all is going on about Teddy Roosevelt as he gets off the ship, and everybody's praising him and all this. And it disgusts the missionary and he said to his wife, it's just not fair. They finally found him a little flat in New York. Found work where they could make a living to care for them in their old age. But the missionary couldn't get over it. He kept telling his wife, it's not right. And finally one day she said to him, you better go in the bedroom and settle that with the Lord. And he went in the bedroom and shut the door. After a bit, he came out composed. And she said, well, what happened? He said, oh, I got in there and I told the Lord how it wasn't fair and it wasn't right. And they were all this and there was nobody here to welcome us and all this. And she said, oh. And he said, yeah. She said, what did he say? He said, oh, he just told me, you're not home yet. And so, you and I, we're not home yet. We're not there. But it's not far off. Jesus is coming. That you and I need to be ready to meet him when he comes. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word, for your admonition, for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, bless each one here. May the Lord Jesus Christ be close to them. May they hang on tenaciously to the promises of your word. May the Holy Spirit do its work in our hearts. Make us kind and gentle, forgiving and loving, that we might demonstrate to those about us the wonderful love of Jesus Christ, that we might be ready, prepared to meet you at your coming. For these things we ask you in Christ's name. Amen. May God bless you. Continue to be faithful. Spend time in this book.